I've been skating for almost 30 years. I mean, I spent the majority of my career making video parts and filming tricks and trying to push myself in order to outdo my previous video part and push the boundaries of skateboarding in whatever way that I can. It's all presented as the same. You, you film your tricks and you do your tricks and you put them all together and you make this really impressive, you know, trick project, but it doesn't feel like it's the soul of why we skateboard. Um, you know, the feeling of riding your skateboard and getting outside of, you know, your comfort zone and just exploring and that's what's always excited me, like going to new cities and seeing new places and meeting new people. And that's always just been the part of skateboarding that has kept me energized and kept me excited. I feel like skateboarding needs more projects that tell the story of the life of a skateboarder rather than just showing someone's best tricks. I think it's good to know why it didn't happen. How did he go about it? What were the tries like? What's the story behind the trick? Like, I feel like all that's missing when you just watch a video. You just think that the guy's the best in the world, but I feel like knowing what an individual went through to get that trick is just as important as the trick itself. And that's what this video is about. I don't know, I'm just kind of crazy because I, I don't know. If something goes down back here, I can't just like get here quick enough. I don't know, there's a bunch of sk stuff to skate around here that's fucking awesome, man. I don't know what's over in Thailand. I don't be looking for spots and shit. Once I get somewhere, I think I just don't, I don't like flying, whatever, sometimes, but once I get everywhere I've ever been, I've had the most amazing time and skated the most obscure, awesome spots that I'll never get to go to again. And I'm just lucky to even being able to even go to those spots and it's the most rewarding experience ever to be able to just skate something new you've never seen out of a van in a random country and just busting with your homies or trying your best to do whatever you can is the best thing ever. I don't know, the whole thing all the way up to that point 
<laughs> it just takes me a while to settle into the thought of flying to Turkey or something with, I don't know what the hell they got over there and shit. Like, I don't know, I just pack my bag full of snacks and hope for the best. <laughs> my mom and family didn't even want me to go on that, on, go to Turkey. They're like, dude, that's like bordered with some place that has bombs you for fucking being white and shit. <sighs> Whoa, that's gnarly. Dude, I hate being cattled. I don't, like, you get on a plane, you have to, you feel like cattle. Unless you're like rich and get first class where they're shoving cheese down your throat. Just the whole thing, getting on a plane and stuff is rough. You're going to somewhere rad and you forget everything and forget America even exists. I'm so fried that I look at it as seriously like, I think life stops here when I leave because you're just going to some other country and you're just screwed. You're going across water where like, it's so gnarly to me. Like people don't even get to leave their city. Somehow I get to go fucking to countries all over the world. It's crazy. some guy that's a hero that hates skateboarding and yeah a guy just woke up on the wrong side of the bed and if it was anywhere else then you know there probably would have been some sort of a confrontation but just being in Istanbul who knows what they do to you when they get you behind bars if he had just sat there and watched for a couple minutes everyone was out of the way Tommy would have just got his trick and the guy could have you know enjoyed it just like everybody else because everybody else there was stoked that he was there it was drawing a crowd, it was interesting. And this guy just took it upon himself to just be a dick about it.
really want to get in there with a woman? I'm gonna take her on a four-wheeler with a boombox system. He's getting laid tonight. <laughs> Honestly, this is like the test. Like, if, you, if you're if you're a skater, a sponsored skater, talk to the person next to you on the plane or wherever you're going. And ask what they do. They probably work a nine to five job. They're probably bummed. They're probably in a suit and a tie. Have to be at a meeting as soon as they land. Like, if you, <laughs> that should be the test. Like, you should probably ask whoever you're sitting next to on a flight. I don't know. I always think about that now. I'm like, this guy's going to work. What am I doing? <laughs> Not doing anything. So that's kind of, I don't know. I look at it like that now after injuries and not being able to skate and kind of maybe thinking that I wasn't gonna be able to be sponsored anymore. So kind of opened up my eyes a little bit. It doesn't really scare me. It just kind of makes me want to skate more. I mean, I don't get scared. Like I know I'm gonna have another knee problem eventually one day. I'm only getting older, you know, and skateboarding's only getting more retarded. And so you gotta try and hang with it. But I mean, I didn't honestly know if I was gonna be going on trips again or anything like that. So when I went on Portugal, I was like, this is awesome. I'm stoked. And, yeah, I just took, I guess, made the best of it, took advantage of it, and tried to skate as much as I could and make the most of the trip and just had a good time. Because you never know if it's going to be your last one with like injuries and stuff. So yeah, I fell, I thought it was broken, right here. So I looked right here, it wasn't broken. So I looked down here, and it was all sucked in, dislocated. And yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't straighten it out, it was just stuck like that. The closer we got to the hospital, the more the pain got worse and worse until he put it back in. Even after he put it back in, it still kind of hurt. The pain had subsided a little bit, but not that much. Yeah, I guess I could have gone home, but I didn't even think about going home. Like, it was like, fuck it, I'm staying. Like, why go home? This place is awesome. Like, I have friends that, yeah, never even left Whittier. Like, and I've been everywhere because of my boy, wherever my boy you know, takes me, I go. But yeah, when I think about it, it is crazy. Like, that's the real riches in life is traveling and seeing the world not just staying in one place.
Tommy's one of the gnarliest skateboarders I've ever seen. Whether how tough he is, his dedication to skateboarding, or how, how hard he'll push himself through whatever circumstance to get what he wants. On the Portugal trip, he rolled his ankle and we were all like really bummed. When anybody gets hurt on one of the road less traveled trips, you quickly realize how big of a deal you know, it is because once we leave, it's over. You know? You're not going back and getting it later, so you just get what you get and that's it. And Tommy rolled his ankle and we'd pretty much written him off for the trip. And the next day, he finds this double set that he wants to skate and it was a massive double set. Like it would have been big for anybody, even with, in perfect conditions. I don't know, it was gnarly to, to even want to skate that in the first place, much less have had a rolled ankle just like the day before or two days earlier. He, at first, I think he wanted an Ollie manual, Ollie the double set, and he tried that a few times and it just absolutely was not happening. And then he was just like, oh, I'm gonna front someone 80, and we all thought that was gnarly too because the curb was so close before it that you really couldn't get a good setup. It was like one try you'd get a good setup, the next try would suck. Anyway, he was jumping down this big ass double set on the cobblestone with a hurt ankle. And then he went 80 it, and it, he, you could see the, the dissatisfaction in his face that like, yeah, that was whatever. He walked back up and was like, I'm gonna try and frontside flip it. <laughs> we were all just like blown away that this dude had a rolled ankle. And I think he might even be, it might even be his front ankle. And he tried, I don't know, 20 times, 25 times. It was like the worst case scenario, basically. There's times like that where you just realize how gnarly Tommy is. And we were just all sitting there just in awe that this dude was, of all things he chose to jump down, that double set was it. And he powered through it and battled the frontside flip and did it like an absolute hero. And I think he might even have shot the camera birds after or whatever. Tommy Gunn's just hyped, felt like that was what he wanted to do and that's what he was gonna do regardless if it was good for the video. He didn't even care. He just set out on a path and he was gonna accomplish it no matter what. I don't know, watching him endure and go through what he goes through to get what he wants is gnarly. And on that Montana trip, you know, he'd only driven his motorcycle locally around San Diego. And he showed up and was gonna ride his motorcycle like halfway across the country. And I, I didn't even know what to say. I wanted to like give him advice, but I realized who I was talking to, he was gonna work it out and it wasn't even gonna matter. And time after time, ride after ride, I was just blown away you think you're a relatively tough person and then you can like deal with whatever and then you hang out with somebody like Tommy and it quickly reminds you that like you're not. I don't know, there's, there's no one like him. Said I'm the wicked one and quite aware I lost my nerve, I said don't despair
Every time rolling up to a rail like that when you're on tour, there's this feeling of anxiety and excitement at the same time because when the rail is that perfect and that good, but that big, you don't know if you're going to be the dude that's going to pull the trigger, you know? And I'm just glad that Tony started Step Step first because I don't know, I, I was, I was, gosh, I, I don't know. That was a big rail. It was cool though. Yeah, to see him struggle with it, it's always hard. You get emotionally wrapped up in it, and you want to see him do it just like you would want to see yourself do it, you know? It's like, it's your friend. From the beginning, they're really excited, and yeah, I'm gonna do this, and then sort of facing defeat, and it's like every single time that they go for it, each try, they get further and further in debt with themselves, and that feeling of, am I gonna get this or not? It's it's a horrible feeling. It's a horrible <laughs> thing and it's it's strange that skateboarders are different in the sense that they're not afraid to fail. But then at the same time, it's like each time that you don't get the trick after every try, it really gets in your head, you know? And and to see him to see him walk away the first day and not get it was devastating, you know? After trying for that long on that big of a rail and then to not you know, it's almost like if you get smoked, it's like, okay, you can like let go and, you know, it's like this horrible thing that we put ourselves through, you know. It's like, I'm either getting worked on this thing or I'm going to get it. And uh, so for Tony to just be completely exhausted and have to get up the next day to do it is insane. And I'm really impressed with the fact that he got up the next day and went for it, you know. Ah, oh, I get it. <laughs> you serious? Your weakness. Yeah, I didn't know you were like that. Dude. <laughs> you said it's huge. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. This zone here is also the zone that we put crap everywhere. So it looks like storage because we're not allowed to live here just so you know. So when the landlord comes through, we just, we just use the place for storage of crap. And then this room gets locked when they come through. We don't know where the keys are for that room. Um, and here's the bedroom. I'm on the bottom bunk down here. Then Ed Duff is above me. We bought these wooden bunk beds from Walmart one day because we wanted to be bunk buddies. Uh, Kyle Frederick at the top here, and then Aunt Travis at the bottom on this one. And then we have the futon for whoever's in town at the moment, and they can just crash on the futon. We have extra pillows and blankets. We're very homely here. We'll take in anyone. Anyone, we just want more friends. There's Brockman up the top on the wall, because Brockman's a man. And then we have the full homey wall here. Have just all the bros and all their photos that they have in mags. And then Scarface, because he's the homie too. Oh, we got Smolik the other day to come in and sign his photo. <laughs> so good. Stay up, sugar bear. Yeah, it has like a little quote from him printed on it. And the last bit in it was, stay up, sugar bear. It was really good. More Tom. Wait, is that from this trip? 
Where is that from? That's from Portugal. Yeah, there we go. Road less traveled. He's back nose money. I like living here. It's like it's like being on a homey trip with all your friends, like 24/7. Like you know, when you're a kid and everyone just packs into a car and you pay for like one hotel room and six dudes sleep in it on the floor. And I like to be just somewhere new all the time. So going on trips has never phased me. Even like my first trips, it's not like I ever got homesick. Like you, you miss your friends and you miss being back at home, but you don't miss it enough to where it outweighs all the good things about being other places and new people you meet and the new, new things you get to experience. I don't know, Thailand was like super different everywhere else I'd been because most of the other places I'd been for skating, I feel like I'd heard something about it before and I knew what I was getting into, kind of. We would have been pretty, uh, yeah, pretty jacked if we didn't get Levi and Oat to help us out and show us around. Like, that's definitely the sort of place you wouldn't really be able to go and just figure it out on your own. Everything was like super spread out to skate and you had to figure out like times and places before going there. So I guess if you went to some of the spots on the wrong day, you'd just think it was completely unskatable, but just because we had those guys to help us out, definitely uh, paved the way a little bit for us. It would have been pretty hard to get much filming done otherwise. I fucking love you, Oat. I always will. <laughs> you legend. You legend. You legend. <laughs> Thank you.
It was nuts, dude. Like, who tries a 17 stair rail more than like three, four times? I don't even know how this shit happens, but it happens. It started to get wetter and wetter, and I'm just like freaking out. Like, like what is he doing? Like, I really don't want to see him get hurt. Or who knows? Like, the ground was landing on, he was face sliding on sandpaper. Like, it was the roughest ground ever. And it was wet. <laughs> So the fact that he didn't get hurt is he won already. You're not gonna win this. You never do. Yeah, that's what I thought. If I hadn't stopped, my confidence was so low that I, who knows what would have happened if I kept trying, I would have really gotten hurt. So it kind of comes to a point where you just realize, I guess, your limits <laughs> as a human with skin and it getting ripped off a bunch. Before I could even like say like anything, like, oh, I need, you know, gauze or anything, Oat's there wrapping my hands and giving me water and taking care of me. And I don't know, it's just the kind of guy he is. He's, Besides all the stuff he did as far as tour guiding, after like at every spot we went to, he would be skating. You know, every spot we would try and go to, he would, you know, skate. And he was gnarly. It wasn't like he was like skating flat ground. He would try and skate the spots with us. I kind of knew that the other guys that were up at the rail were getting, not really, I didn't think they were getting kicked out, but I knew there was like some tension with some people, like, like there was a kick out kind of coming, you know? I thought like something was kind of happening over there. So I found like the other spot that I was kind of trying to skate and get a trick on. I was like mucking around on that and I thought it was going to be all right. I thought it was going to be chill because we were over to the side, not really with the main group. I remember just looking up and then there's this little old dude with a samurai sword coming up to me with and pulling it out of its sheath. How did this get to a dude pulling a sword on me in like 30 seconds? I like, I didn't even see the dude coming. Levi felt like we were that good of friends that he'd like pretty much put his life on the line to like, just like stick up for you, you know? And like, he was so bummed that something like that was happening. And it's just, it's, it's amazing. It's awesome that, that like you can become such good friends with someone so quick. The guy pulled a sword, like, and he's jumping in between me and a dude with a sword. You know, like, that's, that's like lifelong friend type shit. And, I don't know, we got there in a week and a half, two weeks. So that's awesome. Now we're Facebook buddies. <laughs>
iPhone, I saw the future in your eyes But it turns out I was open in a lie Though some folks may say that I don't love you But darling, I think about you all the time Oh, all of the memories you left behind and I can't get you off my mind And I'm holding back these teardrops from my eyes Cause I can't get you off my mind Are you a me? You don't do that! Well, I wish that Try and make it turn around and stay I know you may believe that I don't miss you But darling, I dream about you every day